and with the Intersecretary Working Group on Household Surveys to bring you a bit of a follow-up uh, cafe from two weeks ago where we had the most interesting topic on the impact of COVID-19 um, uh, on our statistical operations with a, with a particular focus on household surveys. And during that um, conversation, we had a very good question posed to us, which was, how do we deal with the impact of a change in a change in uh, mode of data collection uh, through the weighting and estimation phases of our surveys of our um, survey methodologies. So it's my great um, pleasure, and I really do appreciate um, our speakers for very short notice. We've brought to you today um, three speakers who have got particular expertise in weighting and estimation, uh, who are going to share with us uh, what they are uh, doing and their recommendations in dealing with mixed mode data collection through the lens of weighting estimation. So we've got a speaker from the University of Michigan whose expertise is in the area of weighting and estimation and uh, Mr Bruce Fraser from the Australian Bureau of Statistics who was dealing with all the weighting estimation issues with their own uh, household survey program. And finally, um, Kevin McGee from the World Bank who uh, is um, dealing with all the introduction of phone surveys due to COVID-19 in the World Bank um, space. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we are using MS Teams here and it'd be really great if you could keep your, so along the top, along the bottom of the screen there, you'll see in the MS control bar, if you could keep your, um, the, the main one is to keep your microphone on mute if possible. Uh, some of the SCAT team will um, put you on mute, mute if um, unfortunately we can hear you. If you have any bandwidth issues with the internet, please, we recommend you keep your video on off. Uh, this will improve with bandwidth. And on the right hand side there, um, about the sixth one along, there's a little box that says meeting chat. And we really do encourage you to put questions in the meeting chat. Our speakers will either address them in the meeting chat box or we will have um, a good 15 minutes Q&A at the end of the session to um, address your questions as best we can. So without further ado, oh sorry, and then finally, two more points. This meeting is recorded and we will share it on our web page uh, so you can go back and have a look at the uh, experience of our colleagues uh, as well as the questions and answers that were provided. And uh, we really are looking for your feedback on the cafe, so we do encourage you at the end to make a meeting evaluation survey, but we'll share that in the chat towards the end. So as I said at the start, it's real great pleasure to be partnering with the Intersecretary Working Group on Household Surveys, who uh, are leading globally efforts to support countries with not only household surveys, but particularly the impact of COVID-19 on household surveys. So I would now like to hand over to Howie Chen, who's the Secretariat of the Intersecretary Working Group, and she'll just give us a bit of an update on, on what's been happening. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Howie. Thank you so much, Gemma. Um, it's a great pleasure to work again. Um, thank you for pulling this together. It's, it's in such a short period of time. It's great to see all three speakers. Um, let me take control of my slides. I'll definitely complete it in less than five minutes. Um, so can you see the screen in PowerPoint? Yes, that's well, great. Okay. Yep. Yes. So um, just a uh, couple of uh, seconds on our group. Uh, I know many of you were here two weeks ago. Uh, we are a collaborative group uh, to work together to really help moving household surveys forward. So we have three objectives to really improve coordination among ourselves and also make sure that efforts in countries are coordinated. We're there to advance the methodology and also to scale up um, methods um, in, in uh, countries that have, uh, have less capacity or need help. And we're there to enhance communication um, to really advocate for the importance and value of hazard surveys. So we were established in 2015. Now, right now we have uh, 11 international agencies and eight countries, 
and Young Women and the World Bank are the current co-chairs. We, the secretary is Yon Nesti. Um, a bit recap from last time, uh, we had more than 140 participants in the last webinar and most of them from national statistics offices countries and we had four presentations and you can see that in three of the countries that were presented uh, two weeks ago in the previous webinar and they all have switched modes. So Malaysia was face to face plus phone and then they switched completely to phone plus web. The Philippines uh, were using really four different modes and uh, Korea did face to face because it was an income expenditure. So it was really complicated uh, to, to use phone at the beginning uh, before, but now they, they switched to mixed mode. So they all talk about the challenges and, and that's why the weighting issue came out. And the World Bank had a really interesting presentation using RDD and then you show how biased the sample is. And then uh, what's, and so that kept us thinking about how do we really get a better frame so we can at least correct the biases. So um, one last slide on our group. So we're there really to help moving to, uh, forward on the methodologies. And here, for example, I had put the link there. Uh, we had a new publication on uh, planning and implementing household service under COVID. So there was the protocols. How do you follow if you're going to do a face to face survey under COVID? What are things you should be taking into consideration? And we really uh, uh, value our collaboration with our original commissions that it has close collaboration with the countries and we're working with country want to make sure that methods are scaling up or the advances or the innovations are scalable to many of the countries and lastly uh, a little bit of uh, uh, advocate here and we have a side event uh, uh, at the U UN Statistical Commission so we are actually collecting your input everybody input on a vision, a collective vision of all of us, and the how to position how to serve it for the next for the next decade. So it is a New York time, uh, Friday 19th. And uh, if you click more information, you'll be able to register and we'll send you the link to the WebEx connection. Thank you. That's it. Oh yeah, there's this is our COVID um, portal. So there's also a link you can find information there. Thank you, Gemma. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Howie. And uh, yeah, we'll put a link to this positioning household surveys in the next decade in the chat because one of the questions we had from the audience was, do we see a future or not, you know, for household surveys? Um, and so I think this is an extremely timely side event um, and an extremely um, useful conversation around. Uh, and, and I think the answer to the question that's coming out is, is not so much do we or don't we see the role of household surveys, but it's how do we position household surveys um, in the next decade? Um, I, I personally do see a role for household surveys, but it's how do we well position them uh, as part of our suite of approaches we can use for data collection. So thank you very much, Howie. And let's move quickly on to our three speakers because we've got excellent speakers for you today. The first speaker is uh, Ms. Tuba Sergen uh, Gertiken, and we've reached out to Tuba. She works for the Survey Research Centre at the Institute of Social Research, which is an extremely well known institute um, for survey methodologies at the University of Michigan. Uh, they do some excellent work, not only there um, in, in the US, but globally, these are one of the really great institutes for survey methodologists. And Tuba's particular ex expertise is around, and, and interest is around estimation inference. So Tuba, over to you, and thank you very much for joining us today. And we're just going to, you need to go off mute, Tuba, so you're on mute. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you um, today. And um, so I have 10 minutes and I'm going to be quick, but um, I will briefly uh, talking about mixed mode survey estimation and inference. And in this 10 minutes, I can just touch the surface and emphasize the important points. Um, but I also listed references especially review papers that you can uh, basically look up and apply um, 
to your um, case studies. The main takeaway from the existing so literature excuse is... Excuse me, sorry, Tuba. Uh, so just at the top of the screen, take control. You need to move to your slide. Yeah, I, I, did, I, 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 I took Fantastic. control. Thank so you. This is, this is my introduction. Thank you. So the main takeaway from the existing literature is that statistical methods are already well developed and depending on the available data, survey budget and data release requirements, you can plan and apply these methods with some good understanding. Two major assumptions about the single mode survey inference largely accepted are measurement errors are ignorable compared to non-observation errors and quantifying measurement errors is difficult. But in the mixed mode survey context, you need to diagnose whether mode effects uh, are um, that are selection and or differential uh, measurement errors are ignorable, which is statistically small. While diagnosis of ignorable differential measurement errors largely simplifies the estimation, we survey methodologists and statisticians are amused by studying non-ignorable differential measurement errors but please keep in mind that data users do not share our amusement all the time. So I would like to start reviewing by the kinds of mixed mode surveys and different than the original paper by Deleuve. I would like you to start thinking about both selection and or differential measurement errors that could be threats to data comparability over time and or across group, subgroups of these types of uh, in these types of mixed mode surveys. If you start thinking about the survey quality in terms of these terms, mapping and comparing the methods available for your leads will be easier. There will not be one fit all approach when it comes to mixed mode survey inference. As long as you have the transparency of your diagnosis results and explanation of the chosen inference method that will serve the scientific and policymaking community well. So practitioners can mix survey modes at three phases, contact, follow up and response or combinations of these strategies. Adaptive and responsive survey design research provides tools to formulate these combinations with specific quality outcomes. I specifically put the response phase last as part of our discussion as that's where we could clearly address the non-ignorable differential measurement error. Mixed mode at contact phase strategies are developed by practitioners and researchers, and they later explain the mechanisms that yield the desired survey quality outcomes, such as increasing response rates. And you can see some examples that I cited here um, for your reference. Regardless, if single mode is used, the data comparability across subgroups is not threatened due to differential measurement errors. Contact phase includes advanced notifications in multiple modes or multiple, um, uh, multiple modes in recruitment and screening. Mixed mode and follow-up phase strategies are main interest of, again, adaptive and responsive survey design research. At the same time, similar to mixed mode contact strategies, if single mode is used, the data comparability across subgroups is not threatened due to differential measurement errors. In terms of mixed mode surveys at response phase, different persons are interviewed by different modes in cross-sectional and or panel surveys and for sur survey estimates, responses from different survey modes will be used. The main rationale is to reduce cost per interview, but this rationale can be justified under certain conditions. For example, American Community Survey conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau uses a sequential mixed mode survey design that starts with the least expensive survey mode due to lower variable cost and conduct the follow-ups using more expensive yet with high response uh, survey mode. So how do we define measurement error? Measurement error is departure of the survey response to a measure from the true value of measure for the respondent. 
Statistically speaking, and here I'm presenting the bias component of the measurement error, since variance largely depends on the sample size and sample design. Measurement error is the difference between the expectation of survey responses from person I over repeated measurements and the true value of the quantity of interest for person I. For example, Y sub I is the total number of hospital emergency visits in the last 12 months for person I. Because of the nature of surveys, we expect measurement error due to question effects, respondent characteristics and behavior for interview administered surveys, we expect interview characteristics and behavior also causing measurement error. And again, in the single mode surveys, univariate distributions include systematic measurement errors, and they are assumed to be ignorable for comparability purposes due to ignorable selection effects. In the mixed mode surveys, the formulated systematic component of the measurement error due to survey response mode that is M sub B, P, in combination with the selection could threaten data comparability. Diagnosis of ignorable selection and measurement effects in mixed mode surveys require more careful planning. Unless you specifically desire to isolate the differences due to question, respondent and entire effects, differential measurement error usually combines these effects plus mode effects in diagnosis methods. Here, I would like to give an example uh, from NHIS National Health Interview Survey related to total number of hospital emergency visits in the last 12 months for person I. So this estimate is a combination of three questions and yet each question is asked and this uh, uh, survey is conducted in in-person and telephone modes. Although it's not explicit in their design description, it's a mixed mode survey. So interviewers conduct the same survey via in-person visit or via telephone. Yet there are these instructions for the interviewers to try to understand if there's confusion on the response side. And if there is any confusion, they will provide some descriptions of, for example, what a health office is. Yet they need to rely in an in-person um, in a telephone interview just on the auditory clues of respondents possible confusion and that could cause some mode effects that could change systematically some of the responses collected from the respondents. So this is an example for a mode effect like M sub P component. So while quantifying the measurement error is difficult, analytical approaches are available. A list of review papers are again provided at the end, and I can um, group these methods under like four uh, groups. That's diagnosing and diagnosing and adjusting. So using gold standard and administrative data record systems for tar target population members, using benchmarks, and using repeated measurements on the same respondents. And we can also use statistical modeling and analysis approaches, including regression models, imputation models, plus propensity uh, score matching analysis methods. Um, again, the takeaway is um, despite diagnosing differential selection and measurement error literature is well developed, uh, applications are still scarce. Uh, design and estimation strategies go hand in hand uh, and uh, you need like some uh, planning and also you need some budget for doing applying some of these methods. But again, uh, at this point in the mixed mode surveys, at least you need to diagnose like if the uh, differential measurement errors are igno ignorable versus not ignorable. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you very much, Tuba. Uh, so I think just to summarize, Tuba's made three really important points there. So the first the first point that Tuba's made is 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 and, and she's particularly focused there on the response um, and potential response bias. Is that bias likely to be ignorable or non-ignorable? And these are these are technical terms. 
And in a lot of cases, um, we like to assume it's ignorable, that we can assume there is no response bias. But uh, as Tube has mentioned here, it, it, um, often it's not. And so it's non, what's called non-ignorable. So you cannot ignore the fact that you're likely to have a bias. Therefore, your second step is to diagnose that. And so Tube has highlighted there are several ways we can diagnose this. Last, last um, cafe, we talked, we compared respondents and non-respondents, so looking at the different response groups. Uh, Tube has also mentioned in there, you can uh, look, look again, compare your survey responses with administrative data or against a benchmark survey, which print, in the case of household surveys, you could compare it with your census data, for instance, your population census data. And then finally, if if it, if you diagnose that there is a non-ignorable bias, um, then you need to adjust and therefore do some modelling or some adjustments is the takeaway. So Tuba, thank it's a very clear framework. I um, really do appreciate that. And um, and as Tuba said, the, her slides here have some excellent, um, not only structured well, but some excellent references to follow up, which we will share in the meeting chat as well as on our website. So do Tuba's provide us with a wonderful resource of papers um, and material here. Uh, so thank you very much, Tuba. Uh, and this moves very nicely into our next um, presentation from Mr. Bruce Fraser, who's the director of Household Survey Methodology at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And um, Bruce and I have worked together many, uh, many times. Bruce was my supervisor at the Australian Bureau of Statistics, so I can vouch for his um, mm. expertise and his strong methodological skills in this area. Bruce is going to actually follow a, quite a similar framework to what Tube has just presented with us and share with us how the House uh, ABS has dealt with uh, mixed mode data collection weighting estimation. Thank you very much, uh, Tuba, and over to you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Um, yes, I will start off with a similar framework to Tuba, but luckily I'm going to not talk about the bit that Tuba's already talked about. Um, so I've got a little diagram here. So when we talk about differences in modes, um, there's two sorts of differences we're talking about. And these are what Tuba called the selection um, effect and the response effect. And I've called it the difference in who responds and the difference in how people respond. The how is the measurement error. So, sorry, I've got, I've got to click here. So Tuba talked a bit about the measurement error. So uh, this is something we can control. And normally by using good questionnaire design principles, we try and minimize uh, the extent to which this error can happen. So, so we can control that. We usually try and make it small. But whoops, one slide too many. Uh, on the other hand, um, the differences in the types of people who respond by mode, often what we do as statistical agencies will magnify those differences because we try to give people uh, their choice of mode, whatever suits them best. Mm. Um, sorry, so Bruce. Sorry, Bruce. Can I just interrupt for a moment? Uh, sure. Do apologise. Uh, I'm still, the screen I'm seeing on the PowerPoint is still Tuba's references. Can you? No, oh, okay. okay. I'm now on your opening slide, waiting for mixed mode. So it's your title page. Okay, I'm mm. on my third slide. You're That's on what third I can slide. see. Just check in, Afsana. Can you check, Afsana? What can you see? Uh, I'm on the first slide. So, uh, Bruce, would you like me to take the control? Sure. Okay. So I take the control. Uh, I'm now on the third slide. Yep. Is it all right? Yep. Number with the two two orange ovals. Uh, with two orange. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank so uh, Bruce, just let me know when you want to move to the next. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll recap very quickly, then we can jump forward. So, the measurement error, the differences in how people respond, we normally try and minimise that through good questionnaire design. Whereas uh, the types of people that respond by different modes, we will often magnify that by giving people a, a free choice or, or whatever mode suits them best. Okay, we can move forward. 
Um, so this is the ABS experience of the differences in the types of people that respond by mode. Um, this is just one of our surveys. Uh, and we're looking at two modes here, an online mode and a face-to-face -face mode. Um, so overall, 44% of respondents respond online, but we get a higher than average online response um, from people who are highly educated in high socioeconomic uh, areas, um, aged 55 and over, or people in multiple adult households. So these are households other than single person or couples with or without dependent children. And conversely, uh, the face-to-face -face mode, we get higher than average take up amongst unemployed people, areas with high disadvantage, uh, single adult with children households, and the ages 13, uh, sorry, 15 to 34. Okay, next please. Uh, now, I won't talk too long about this table, but um, this is from a quarterly survey that we were conducting before and after the pandemic hit. So we did three quarters between July 2019 and March 2020, uh, which before the pandemic hit, and um, we offered both face-to-face -face and online. Then in April 2020 for quarter four, uh, the face-to-face -face interviewing was withdrawn due to health and safety concerns for, for our interviewers. Now, I won't spend too long, but you can see uh, for quarters one to three, we've got a pretty consistent 80% response rate, regardless of where it came from. And these rows, these are deciles of an area measure of um, socioeconomic disadvantage. So number one are the most disadvantaged areas, number 10 are the least disadvantaged areas. Once the face-to-face -face mode was withdrawn, we suddenly get uh, quite a difference in the response rate according to the socioeconomic disadvantage. And so normally what we would do, normally if we saw these response rates in that second last column, we'd say, oh, well, the sample's not balanced with respect to this. So we would try and weight up the most disadvantaged areas to, to restore that balance. However, um, this can be dangerous as I'll go on to explain. So next slide, please. And I can't see what you're seeing, sorry. So <laughs> I'm just hoping the slides are keeping up with me. So what we're looking at here, um, here we've got a ratio. This ratio is the average household income for those respondents who respond face to face, divided by the average household income of those people who respond through an online form, those households, I should say, through an online form. So if we have a ratio of one, uh, that means whether you respond face to face or whether you respond online, we're getting the same average income from those respondents. Um, but if you look at this, um, the index of relative socioeconomic disadvantage in our deciles, you'll see these most disadvantaged areas, they have quite a big difference in the income that's reported face to face to online. Now, what I'm saying is um, we don't believe this is a measurement error. We don't, we're not saying this is a measurement error. It's not that there is something in the online form that makes you report higher income. What the effect is, is a selection effect. So people who have a lower household income are more likely to do the face-to-face -face interview. Um, um, and people with a higher income are more likely to do the online. Um, so jump forward one slide. Um, so you can see there's, there's three cells in particular that would be of a concern because there's a very different average income depending on mode. So this is where it's not ignorable. It's not ignorable because a household's income level seems to influence their choice of mode that they use to respond. So we have an average 44% online take up overall and, and these groups have a lower online take up. Now, if we remove face-to-face -face interviewing, which happened in the pandemic, or, or if something else changes the modes, that's going to feed through to income because we lose the face-to-face -face respondents, we keep the online respondents, and that will cause income to be overstated in those categories. Okay, jump forward. Um, 
But then there are, there are some other categories where even though we had a, a strong preference for online, the incomes are very similar. So this is an example of where the income is ignorable uh, in, in respect of um, how, how we might weight by these categories. So um, even though there might be quite a change in the mode of response within these groups, we believe that that's not going to affect income. Now, of course, one complexity is we're usually not just worried about one variable. There might be several, but anyway, I'm just making the point with respect to income. Okay, let's move forward. Um, so there's four potential approach. Well, there's probably more than four, but four that I've listed on this slide that we can consider. So there's post stratification or benchmarking techniques. Uh, so we can do that, but as I've tried to illustrate, we need to be careful that um, the post strata that we form are not going to introduce this effect. So to take my example, if we just tried to use that area disadvantage level and weight up by that, we run the risk of overstating income in those most disadvantaged areas because we disproportionately lose low income households when we lose the face to face. So we have to be careful, look for ratios that are, that are close to one in our post strata group, then we're more confident um, we can post stratify that way. Um, also, as, as Tuber also mentioned, if we use administrative data, especially something that's informative for what we're trying to measure. So if we're doing an income survey, uh, can we use government payments of benefits data, administrative data to post stratify? Um, I won't talk a lot. I'm happy to expand in questions if people are really interested, but another approach is to try and um, estimate a response propensity and use the inverse response propensity as weighting. Or another thing we toyed with is um, modeling the propensity of responding by a certain mode. So propensity to choose a face-to-face -face mode. And uh, then try to align uh, the propensities, uh, you know, when face-to-face when -face is no longer offered, but to make those people who would have responded face-to-face, -face, I guess, to have them in the same proportions as you had when face-to-face -face was offered. So jump forward again. Um, so this is some of the ABS experience. Now, in the main, um, we've found our normal sort of weighting, which is age, sex, location, post-stratification, has been pretty effective. Um, it, it's handled most of the impacts, so we haven't had a lot to worry about. Um, in, for some surveys, we have also looked at area level measures of disadvantage, such as were in my tables, and um, proportion of renters, uh, one specific thing where the people, proportion of people renting households seem to be understated. Um, so we looked at that. Uh, we did use response propensity weighting for a single month of labour force, the very first month where we had a pandemic effect. Um, but after that, we found it wasn't needed. And administrative data we looked at, but we didn't go ahead um, largely because of concerns about the age of that administrative data and, and how well correlated it might be to current incomes. And final slide, a few issues we need to consider. We need to look at comparability over time. So... Uh, really, we want, after we've finished waiting, we want the characteristics of the sample to sort of align to previous surveys. Uh, we don't want to, to the extent there were problems with previous surveys, if we remove those, that'll have a statistical impact on the time series. Um, as well as mode, we've found uh, what's happening in the field is very important. Uh, we found interviewers, not just doing face-to-face -face interviewers, but interviews, but interviewers doing conversion techniques, knocking on the door and asking people to complete their survey, even if they don't offer a face-to-face -face interview, uh, will we'll change the response and the uptake of modes. And uh, lastly, it's very complex um, when you're measuring something like income and employment and the real world values changed at exactly the same time as as your mode changes. <laughs> um, so that adds complexity, but I won't dwell on that. Okay, thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you very much, Bruce. And um, and yeah, you did follow an extremely similar framework to what uh, Tuba had put forward there. Um, uh, some takeaways from me was that there was, 
the importance of the diagnosis step. So you, sh you showed us several um, graphs there, simple tables that looked by area, by income level, and you found that for some groups, the, the it was ignorable, so you made no adjustment, but for other groups, it was non-ignorable, um, particularly those, those um, different income groups there. And so you went through the diagnosis and then you adjusted and you mainly adjusted with post stratification techniques. Um, it was my takeaway, but then you made an extremely valuable point that I just wanted to reiterate was that you did look at maybe making some adjustments with administrative data, but then that might have itself brought in um, a different type of bias because of the age of the data or whatever. So you chose the ABS there, chose not to bring in um, the use of administrative data to, to make any adjustments because it itself might have affected the quality of your statistics. So I just wanted to highlight that particularly because we have a lot of people in the region, Asia Pacific, who like using administrative data. But I think the lesson there from Bruce and the Australian Bureau of Statistics is an important one too to reinforce that um, you know changing your weighting or adding administrative data as an adjustment method may itself bring in a bias um, if you don't look at it carefully so so thank you very much uh, bruce and thanks abs for for sharing your uh, valuable experience i'd now like to move on to our third speaker who is um Kevin from the World Bank, and as you heard from Howie, the World Bank have brought in random digit dialing phone surveys, um, and Kevin um, has put a particular focus on um, weighting and estimation. So, Kevin, over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gemma, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone, and many thanks for, for the invitation to present. So um, I'll be presenting some work that's joined with a couple of other colleagues uh, at the World Bank. It's a, it's a work in progress, uh, but drawing from our, our recent experience. Um, and we're, we're looking at uh, reducing bias in phone survey samples, examining the effectiveness of uh, reweighting techniques using representative frames. Um, and just a bit of background before getting to the specifics. Um, here I might be preaching uh, to the choir to some degree, so uh, bear with me if that's the case. Um, but in general, at least on their own, phone surveys uh, can be prone to bias, at least compared to kind of the more traditional face-to-face -face surveys. Um, on their own, at best, um, they are representative of the phone owning population, which depending on the region that can uh, be a relatively small or uh, the non phone owning population could be relatively large. Um, also, there are difficulties uh, contacting sample households over the phone. Again, depending on the region, uh, you're subject to network uh, reliability, penetration, uh, those kinds of things. And also in general, refusal or non-response rates uh, are generally higher uh, in phone surveys, at least compared to to face to face interviews. Um, so uh, as a result, this if phone surveys do suffer from bias, then uh, inferences drawn from those phone surveys might not fully reflect the conditions of all the segments of the population. And Bruce was showing this a little bit as well, that often the, uh, at least when it comes to phone surveys, often the poorest segments of the population are those uh, not well represented in, in phone surveys. Typically they respond in face-to-face -face, uh, in higher numbers. And if this segment is uh, not well represented, uh, and this is a segment of the population that's particularly important when it comes to uh, policy design. It could lead to um, misinformed uh, design of policy as a result. But there are reweighting methods available to reduce this bias, and these reweighting methods uh, can be particularly effective when a representative face-to-face -face survey uh, is used as the frame uh, for the phone survey and that's exactly what we examine in our study. 
Um, so for our study, we we take uh, a series of phone surveys uh, called COVID-19 high frequency phone surveys or HFPS. Uh, these are surveys that uh, my team, the LSMS team at the World Bank, uh, are supporting in six different African countries. Uh, the list is there. Um, they've started um, shortly after the, the real global effects of the pandemic uh, were felt April, May, June, depending on the country. Uh, and they've extended uh, up to uh, 12 different rounds, uh, one round per month in most cases. And I've included a few links here. But the uh, important common feature of these six surveys is that they all use recent face-to-face rounds of a longitudinal survey called the LSMS ISA uh, as a frame for the phone survey. Uh, and these are not uh, mixed modes uh, surveys. The HFPS are exclusively phone. So that's one one deviation, I think, from from the other presenters. Uh, let's see. Now the LSMS ISA, which serves as the frame for the, the phone survey, these are all uh, national, nationally representative uh, panel surveys, and they all collect detailed information on re household demographics, welfare consumption, economic activity, uh, a whole plethora of, of information. And critically, they also collected uh, phone numbers for multiple household members uh, and a reference person, which made it suitable for uh, conducting a follow-up sur phone survey, although that was not the design intention uh, at the start. Um, and these are all uh, relatively recent face-to-face -face surveys within the last, I think, maximum two years, uh, so relatively recent. But one advantage of using these face-to-face -face surveys as a frame for the phone survey is that we have this highly detailed, rich information for all units in the frame. So that includes, uh, in particular, two groups that you usually don't have this kind of information for, and those are uh, the subset of, of units in the frame that are ineligible. Uh, in this case, those would be uh, the units that are households or individuals who do not have a phone or don't have contact information available in the frame. And then also you'll have, we have this highly detailed information on the sample of re, uh, respondents who, who do not respond to the phone survey. Uh, so we have a full set of information on them. And then of course, we also have the same for uh, the, the sample of respondents, successful interviewed uh, respondents from the phone survey. Um, but having all of this detailed information in particular for those first two groups uh, really allows for implementation of some robust uh, reduction methods. And these, uh, these really uh, expands a little bit upon what's available compared to uh, phone surveys that use random digit dialing or telecom lists as a frame, in which case you, you typically do not have information on uh, those first two groups, the ineligible and non-responding samples. So uh, here's a, a quick summary of the of the samples that we have for at least the first four countries that we're focusing on in this study. The other two will be added later. Uh, it's mostly here for reference. I don't want to take too much time, but just to highlight uh, the coverage and response rates that we have, which is taking the full face-to-face -face survey uh, at the top um, and the coverage rate is the share that has uh, phone contact information available so they're eligible for uh, for interview uh, which varies a bit between 73 uh, percent to 79 percent and then in Nigeria it's quite high at 99 percent where uh, mobile phone penetration is, is, is highest at least among these four countries then the response rate uh, at the bottom ranges between 60 and 74 percent, although in Uganda they achieved a quite high response rate of, of 93 percent. 
Then as a result of having this detailed information for the entire frame, we can look and see uh, up across which uh, characteristics or what dimensions we might we see bias in our phone sample and at what stage this bias is introduced. So here in this chart, we're, I've just presented uh, for one indicator here, which is the share of households in the sample that come from the poorest uh, consumption or wealth quintile, so the poorest 20% uh, of the population. And looking at the dark blue bar here, that's our benchmark from the face-to-face -face survey. So this is the, the LSMS ISA. And we can see that if you, when we move to the yellow bar, which is the subsample of the ISA that has LSMS ISA, which has contact information, so our eligible sample, in almost all countries, it uh, the share represented from this uh, poorest consumption quintiles substantially drops, at least in Ethiopia and Malawi. Uh, and then likewise, when we move to the successfully contacted sample in gray and the successfully interviewed sample in uh, green or teal, it further drops. So this just goes to show us that uh, there is bias and in general, the poorest uh, in the population are underrepresented in the uh, in the successfully interviewed sample. Um, and if I show you this for the other side of the um, consumption and wealth quintiles, it's basically a mirror image. And this is just another example using uh, another indicator, but it tells the same story. So we do see this bias, but all hope is not lost. Uh, there is uh, there are reweighting techniques available to reduce the bias interviewed in the sample. Um, and we can harness the information that we have in the frame from these face-to-face uh, -face surveys to impl implement a uh, response propensity weighting adjustment, whereby we model the probability of a unit in the frame responding to the survey based on their profile of characteristics. Um, and then uh, using the estimates from the model, we can um, determine the or estimate the predicted probability that the unit in the frame responds to the survey. The inverse of that uh, would be and the adjustment factor uh, to apply to the existing survey weights. And in this way, the responding households uh, to the phone survey that look similar to the non-responding households have a similar profile of characteristics will receive a higher weight to counteract that bias. Um, just quickly, I know I'm short on time to show you some uh, results showing the effectiveness of the bias correction. So in blue, we have our benchmark here, the LSMS ISA, and we're showing uh, the results for the five consumption expenditure quintiles here. Um, and we're looking at, uh, in green, the phone survey results where the uh, bias adjustment is implemented, and in red, the results where the bias adjustment is not implemented. So just the raw weights with the other uh, uh, adjustments that we include not related to this uh, bias. But when we compare with the benchmark blue, um, with the red, which doesn't include the bias adjustment. We see there's quite a deviation across at least the extreme quintiles. And when we apply the adjustments, uh, the green bars, um, a lot of the bias uh, is disappears, although not entirely. So the green moves much closer to the uh, benchmark after applying the adjustments, but in some cases not uh, doesn't bring it fully in line with uh, with the benchmark. So I just show free Nigeria and Ethiopia here, and then likewise for Malawi and Uganda. Uganda is a little bit of a peculiar case because they have a very high response rate, um, but at least for the other countries, it's pretty clear. So just quickly to wrap up, um, some conclusions that uh, we've seen that in these four countries, 
the poorest segment of the population and the most vulnerable households are underrepresented. Uh, this is a critical segment for policy formulation. Uh, we showed that um, there are reweighting techniques available to reduce the bias. It does, they have uh, substantially reduced the bias, but not fully eliminated. Um, and just to emphasize that uh, effective, by, uh, effective correction of the bias is really essential to make sure the results obtained from the phone survey uh, reflect all segments of the population. And at least in this scenario, using face-to-face -face surveys uh, as a frame for phone surveys has distinct advantages over random digit dialing or uh, phone surveys that use a, a telecom provider list. So th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and again, Kevin's, Kevin's um, presentation it again uses the similar framework that we saw from Tuba there, where um, he's highlighted from the outset that the bias from phone surveys is not ignorable, so it's non-ignorable bias, um, and spent a lot of time, again, diagnosing this, uh, diagnosing it, looking at, it. he showed us the results for education levels and for income levels and similar groups Australia Bureau of Statistics had ten, uh, 10 quintiles, I think, whereas um, Robert showed us five. Um, um, so again, diagnosing by income levels as well as education levels, which was very similar in the Australian case, and then adjusting. And in the case of Kevin's presentation, they adjusted using um, a re what's called reweighting, but it was a pr propensity model which if you recall was also on um, Bruce's presentation. Bruce had four, four approaches to this, post, two types of post-stratification. Post the third approach was to use um, a propensity model and a, the last approach was to adjust using administrative data. And here Kevin's shown us that the uh, rewriting approach with propensity model uh, was what they've applied to the case of the phone survey. So thank, thank uh, three very similar presentations. And, and again, I really thank um, all the presenters uh, and Shuv has given us a great framework to use uh, for that. Um, one of the questions, if I now, um, please do put your questions in the box. I see a couple are coming in now, but let me just start with one that we received pre, pre today. And uh, I'd like to ask um, Bruce from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, about the, the, you didn't list imputation as one of the uh, approaches you might have used for dealing with mixed mode, but maybe if you could give us a little bit of insight into uh, imputation and um, whether it was something that you thought about, um, you, you know, a straight replacement replacement methodology. Bruce, over to you. Yep. Um, so as I said earlier in my presentation, um, generally, we try to make sure there isn't measurement error um, in our instruments. Now, of course, there's always the risk. <laughs> but if you believe your online form and your face-to-face -face or whatever else is getting the correct information from the respondent, um, you wouldn't need to modify that value um, if you have that confidence. Um, it's not always the case. But there's one example um, where for our health survey, um, we asked people to self-report their height and their weight, and then a subsample, basically those who agree to do it, uh, actually get measured. They, they go in and they get blood measurements and they also get measured height and weight. So um, we're able to use that by looking at the respondents for which we have both self-reported and measured, we can fit a model and we can impute actual height and weight for those people who have only given us self-reported um, but haven't been measured. Yep. Um, look, the only other time we sort of use imputation is when there is a problem. And um, we did think we had a bit of a problem. Well, we're pretty sure we had a bit of a problem um, in our income survey, which I was showing before, where people were under-reporting their superannuation. And, and we knew there were people who should have superannuation because it's compulsory 
in Australia, uh, people who were implied, uh, employed who weren't reporting superannuation. So we did impute values and again we used we used the data that we did trust, the data that came from face-to-face -face interviews um, to you know, fit models in, in order that we could impute those amounts. Thank you very much, Bruce. And um, look, while we've got you, and then I'll hand over to Kevin and Tuba, there's actually a question that's come in too about, you, you spoke earlier in your presentation about the dangers of making adjustments. Wondering if you could elaborate on that it's a, it's a bit similar to Kevin's summary at the end, which, you know, the adjustments doesn't deal with all the biases, but any 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 elaboration on what are the dangers of making adjustments? Bruce? Um, look, I, I wonder if I can recall exactly <laughs> what point we were talking about. If it, if it was where I was saying in those most, that most disadvantaged decile, um, there's a big difference in the income reported by modes. Now, if, if we didn't do that analysis by modes, if we only looked at that first table I presented and we said, well, look, we've got much lower response rates in the most disadvantaged areas, what we would normally do is we would increase for weights, we'd use benchmarking. So, so we increase the representation in the sample of those. So the danger is if um, the, I, I guess the non-respondents, in this case, they're non-respondents that are caused by a ceasing face-to-face interviews. So if those people we're missing have a different income to the people that we retain, uh, then there is a danger of introducing a bias, yes, of overstating income. It, I, I hope that answered the question. Um, otherwise, remind me uh, which adjustments we were referring to. Thank, thank you very much, Bruce. Now, an, another question's come in, um, and and any of you could to all presenters from our from our colleagues over in Iran. Have you? And the question is, have you ever considered to ask the interviewees to tell uh, people without phone around them to check the applied microdata? So the question here is, if you have managed to secure a respondent say through your phone survey or a face-to-face. -face. Have you ever asked your respondent to give, give you information about the non-respondents around them, like the household next door or, um, I think this is the question that's coming in. Have you ever considered asking your interviewees to tell you about people around them in, in other households? So, Tuba. So, so in, the, in the context, of pro probability samples um like it's random people it's like it's not likely that people are gonna know about like other non-respondents if that's the question um but in terms of like there's network sampling snowball sampling there are non-probability sampling techniques that uh, when you identify especially for some like vulnerable populations or like rare populations, there are these techniques and they require different estimation methods. And lately, yes, mixed modes are used in that context, but that wasn't uh, like part of like our discussion today. That's that, that that requires a different type of estimation. But yes, like there are um, situations there are cases that we do apply like network sampling or like snowball sampling a recent one is response driven sampling techniques yes we do apply those okay thank you very much tuba and kevin any anything there from your world bank phone surveys uh we haven't done anything along those lines um but maybe one thing somewhat related um, that we were able to do is so from the face-to-face -face panel survey in addition to collecting contact details from the household we also ask for contact details of a reference person so that's a non-household member uh, who would be able to get in contact with the household so originally that was to to be able to reach the household for subsequent rounds of the panel since it's a longitudinal survey but in this case, we were able to use that information to reach out to this reference person and attempt to uh, get in contact even with these households that do not have a phone. Um, 
the response rates were pretty pretty low among that sample, but at least that was one effort to make to to at least incorporate some information from the uh, that segment of the population. But but we haven't uh, haven't considered any any kind of uh, uh, like what uh, suggested by the the commenter. Thank thank you very much, Kevin. And um, Bruce, maybe do you want to talk about this from the Australian point of view as? And there's a question also that's come in about whether you give your respondents um, a, a choice of how they respond. Um, you know, do, can they choose to respond face to face or phone or web or whether there's also a choice given? Bruce, over to you. Yep. So, uh, so I'll respond to the first question first. Um, yes, we do do that. We do that in our census. Uh, Tube is quite right about. Um, sample surveys usually the next door isn't in there and even um, when we have a cluster of households um, we consider exactly who is in the sample to be confidential information so we try not to disclose to the neighbors who else in their block has been selected but for the census we do do that or at least we used to um, so if we can't get in contact with the house next door we ask does anyone live there and how many people live there. And we use those responses um, to impute uh, for that number of people. Yep, um, okay, for the second question, yes, we do give people a choice. Now, we try to steer them um, towards the online mode in particular. So we, we do everything we can to encourage that mode. Um, but at, at the end of the day, if someone chooses uh, that their preference is to do a face-to-face -face interview, uh, we will provide a face-to-face -face interview for them. Uh, same with phone. Thank you very much, Bruce. And, and look, I, I've just noticed, I was so enthralled with this conversation, I've just noticed I've gone over the midday, so my apologies, <laughs> uh, my apologies, everyone. We've we've come to, to our time and we've also sort of exhausted our questions that we had. Um, but at my, again, thank you so much to Tuba, Kevin, to Bruce, and also to Howie um, and our colleagues from the World Bank and the Intersecretariat Working Group for coming together so quickly after this question on waiting was brought up um, two weeks ago. A reminder that this will all be recorded and the links will be available on the website. Um, but just like last time, Howie, I might like, I really would like to give the floor back to to Howie to to summer to to wrap us up and um, and just remind us again of the anything from the Intersecretariat Working Group. Thank you very much. Over to you, Howie. Mm. Uh, it's too bad that Jerry's not here today, so I can't push push it over to him. Um, and just again, thank you so much, um, Gemma and colleagues, to uh, being here, and it's really great pressure to co-organize this um, event. This is completely uh, relevant or linked to our um, positioning paper. In fact, uh, we have thought about a lot about uh, the phone survey came out, and then there was a lot of discussion on would the stakeholders, the policymakers get so um, spoiled by how fast we were uh, with phone surveys that we can deliver and then they would not give us money for a face-to-face -face interview. And we know it's not going to happen. It will be a problem for many countries. And we hear, uh, we heard last uh, in the last webinar in Papua New Guinea, the uh, mobile phone coverage was only about 30, 40 percent. It was very low. So, and we really have a lot of work to do to convince our uh, governments and the donors, really, uh, there's still a lot, long way to go. And, and we have to be careful when we move any direction towards any direction. So please join us uh, on Friday um, on the side event. It's really, really, it's a consultation meeting. So if, even if the timing is bad, you cannot join us, please send us your written comments. So it's still an annotated outline, so we will take into your uh, all the comments into consideration when we develop the full paper. Thank you so much, Gemma. Thank you very much, Howie. And um, yeah, my thanks again to everyone, all the participants for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure having with having um, having you join with us today, and and our three speakers and Howie and the team from the Intersecretariat Group. Uh,
stay in touch. Any other questions that you may have, please just reach out to us as Secretariat. We're happy to try and um, organise these events as we have today. And uh, a reminder in the box there in the chat, please do tell us whether anything you can do to improve our Stats Cafe series. Uh, we're very much happy to hear with you. So thank you again for joining us. Um, have a lovely day. Go and enjoy some lunch or some coffee or for our colleagues calling us today from uh, USA, please, uh, time to go to bed now. Thank you very much for joining us so late in the thank evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you all.